Right. So we have now discussed uh, Hamiltonian formalism and Lagrangian formalism and for both formalisms we have obtained some intuitive insight what are the special properties of those two formalisms, why would you use the Hamiltonian, why would you use the Lagrangian formalism, what are the pros and cons of both. Um, and now we briefly recap why they are actually equivalent in most cases. And uh, for this we uh, simply start with a Lagrangian and let us um, assume a Lagrangian which depends on a set of variables q and q dot and nothing else, which is the normal case. That is our starting assumption and then we c construct the Hamiltonian and uh, get equivalent equations of motion both from the Lagrangian and from the Hamiltonian. So the construction goes like this. We first obtain the canonical conjugate momenta which are pi defined as dl by dqi dot and that provides you with some algebraic relationship between pi and uh, q's and q dots, some formula and uh, then you can construct also a Hamiltonian by a Legendre transformation. So the Hamiltonian is defined as sum over i pi qi dot minus l where you are to insert here um, uh, the relationship between the q's and q dots and the p's and you are supposed to eliminate all the q dots. So you can uh, eliminate the qi dots and then h is a function of the p's and q's only. That is a Legendre transformation. And now we make an assumption which is not always true, but let us assume that the relationship between the p's and the q dots which you are eliminating, that this relationship is unique. So you can uniquely go back and forth between q dot and p. So for any p there are corresponding q dots and for any q dots there are corresponding p's. If that is the case then the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian are equivalent and uh, we can write formally the equation of motion. Zero is equal to d by dt of dl by dqi dot minus dl by dqi which are the Lagrangian equations of motion and the relationship for the piece pi equal dl by dl dq dot are equivalent to the Hamiltonian equations of motion which are pi dot equal to dh derivative with respect to qi and qi dot equal, sorry, minus, uh, sorry, that is of course minus and here plus dh by dpi. Okay. Then we have the equivalence and uh, we don't have to prove it because you did it in classical mechanics and anyway it is a very straightforward simple calculation. And uh, so under this assumption of this unique relationship going in both directions, uh, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian equations of motions are equivalent and the Hamiltonian is related to the Lagrangian by the Legendre transformation.
understood, and this is the case that you have probably um, almost always encountered in classical mechanics, or maybe you have exclusively encountered this case in classical mechanics. But now we have seen in our exercise that it's not always so simple. Actually, there are uh, many cases in physics, and in particular in quantum field theory and field theory, where it's not as simple as that. And so let us now discuss this. And this topic goes under the name of so-called constraints. So there can be the possibility of constraints between all those canonical variables. And uh, let us first give us some examples. And afterwards I will give you the general formalism. And the examples should remind you of the exercise. So, in general, there can be problems in going between Lagrangian and Hamiltonian if uh, the relationship between the Q dots and P's is not one to one. So, and let's uh, exemplify the range of possibilities in terms of some pictures and simple discussions. And the pictures will be in a four dimensional space. We have two coordinates and two velocities, and or two coordinates and two momenta. And that is, of course, the same situation as in our exercises. And uh, so, to draw two-dimensional pictures, we always fix the coordinates q1 and q2, so we will not draw them in diagrams. We will only draw a two-dimensional plane either for the two velocities or a two-dimensional plane for the two momenta. Okay, and then we study the relationship between uh, these two sets of two variables each. And from the two-dimensional pictures, you can then imagine how the multi-dimensional case could look like. Okay, so let's first uh, start by drawing some pictures here. So let's say one picture with Q dots on the left and one picture with P's on the right. And so we start with some point here in the space of velocities. And okay, it will be mapped to some point here in the space of momenta. Some image must exist because of course I can always calculate the momenta by this rule. So clearly there is a mapping and this point will be mapped to precisely one point over there. So, but then we can also go a little bit further and we can, for example, do here some grid lines into this space of velocities and we can, of course, map every point here on the grid to some point over there. Okay, and then the question is how uh, would it look like after we have mapped uh, this whole grid of points somewhere here? And then maybe every line is mapped to some curve here. The mapping might not be linear, so maybe the curves are not straight lines, but something with a curvature. Maybe something like that. Okay. So out of this grid of points, we might get some uh, curves here in, in that space. And so we can uh, ask infinitesimally um, characterize the mapping infinitesimally. Okay, starting from this point, we are not interested globally into the full space, but let us just be interested in small 
perturbations of this point, so let's indicate it by two arrows. And so we might study, okay, if we wiggle around with the point in the two dimensions, what happens with the image? So wiggling in this direction gives us some wiggle here in that direction. Wiggling in this direction gives us some wiggle in that direction. That is the general case. And those two arrows, of course, do not have to be orthogonal. So what do I mean mathematically? So of course you could characterize here some variation by delta qi dot. That would be uh, a description of the two red arrows. And then you get corresponding variations of the piece, delta pi. And how can you calculate the delta pi's? You can calculate them uh, by taking derivatives, namely at first order in the delta q's. This delta pi is given by the derivative dpi, which is a function of the q dots, derivative with respect to qj dot times delta qj dot. Right? So that is the variation in the space of the piece, obtained by taking this derivative. So this is the first order uh, expansion. Now what is this object here? It's a derivative of p uh, viewed as a function of q dot, then once again uh, derived with respect to q dot. But the p's are actually coming from derivatives of the Lagrangian. Therefore we can plug in the definition and we obtain that this is actually the second derivative of the Lagrangian. So we get here the second derivative of L. First with respect to q i dot, that derivative gives us p. And then a second derivative with respect to q j dot. And that gives us this derivative that we want here. So we see that here there appears a matrix of second derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to two velocities. That is a matrix with indices i and j. And this matrix determines how these two arrows here, how uh, small variations in the q dot space are mapped to small variations in the p space. That is a matrix we have already encountered in our exercise. And we now see why the matrix is important. This matrix here, which I call Mij, defined as the second derivative of L with respect to Qj Qi dot. This is a crucial matrix to study the behavior of the mapping between the velocity and momentum space. And so now we can discuss the two uh, basic cases of that matrix. Namely, the matrix can either be invertible or it can be not invertible. And these two cases behave very differently and we will discuss both. And of course, generally speaking, you can always assume a matrix to be invertible in physics and that is the situation where uh, we get this simple relationship over there. But sometimes the matrix is not invertible and then we are in special situations which we need to discuss. Okay, so let us begin with the first case and assume the matrix M is invertible. And in the exercise you remember the simple case of two free particles gave rise to such an invertible matrix. So in that case you see it immediately from the picture. The matrix M is invertible, that means if you start at one phase space point here and you go to this phase space point here and then you wiggle in all possible directions here in the Q dot space, the matrix is invertible. Therefore you get a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping between those wigglings and the wigglings here. So uh, you cover all dimensions of uh, the P space um, in terms of those small variations. And that means uh, all 
momenta in this uh, here two-dimensional plane or in general in the entire uh, volume of the possible momenta can be reached by this mapping. So the entire space can be reached, at least in a region around the point, but let's assume it to be a global property. And therefore, uh, we get an invertible relationship between the Q dots and the keys. And then we are here on the left blackboard. So that means, first of all, section 113 applies. But we can also say something else. Let's go start here in the Hamiltonian formalism. First of all, we see uh, we can reach any point in the P space, all phase space points can be reached. And that means they can also be chosen as initial conditions of our uh, problem. So if we draw the plot here, P1, P2, then you can take any point in this space, any point is possible and uh, any point can be chosen as a starting point of your uh, evolution of the system and so for any point you get a unique time dependence um, in view of Hamiltonian's equation. For each of these points you can now uh, solve for p dot and q dot so every point here can be an initial condition and each initial condition gives rise to some trajectory. So since every point here can be chosen, it means the entire uh, volume of your p-space is filled with tr possible trajectories. Each trajectory uh, also defines a unique time evolution. Which is, uh, and the trajectories are of course given by the equations of motion. Now you can ask how is it in the space of velocities? In the space of velocities, uh, the equations of motion have some unknown behavior, unknown structure, because the Lagrange equations of motion, we do not uh, immediately know what kind of differential equations are these. We do not see are they first order, second order, what order are they, are they linear or nonlinear? Um, we don't know. Here we know what uh, is the type of the differential equation, but in the Lagrangian context we do not know what type of differential equations we get. And uh, therefore, at first we cannot really exclude that maybe the equations of motion disallow some of the points here in the space of velocities. Maybe uh, some points or maybe all of the points here um, are incompatible with the equations of motion also. But now we know, because we know here uh, the entire P space is filled with allowed points which are compatible with the equations of motion. And there is a one to one mapping between the P space and the Q dot space and therefore we now learn that also the Q dot space is completely filled with allowed trajectories which correspond to permissible initial conditions and which can appear as solutions to equations of motion. So this follows now from the Hamiltonian. So also um, uh, any um, value of the Q dots is possible as initial condition and also as a solution of the equation of motion. And uh, therefore, 
in both formalisms, the entire space is filled. So, and uh, when we count the number of physical degrees of freedom, which is the number of pairs q and q dot, or p and q, uh, for which we can impose independent initial conditions, then we get uh, that this is simply the number of uh, variables. So every variable contains physical information. Number of physical degrees of freedom, which would be the number of possible initial conditions on pairs q and q dot is the number n of q and q dot pairs. Okay, so again, this is the standard case, which is simple. Um, everything is equivalent and the entire spaces are filled. And now we finally come to the more surprising cases, which we already encountered in our exercise. And so let's discuss them a little bit further. And uh, so they are both um, obtained if the matrix M is not invertible. M is not invertible and there are two subcases. Let's first study case one. And this is exemplified by uh, the Lagrangian L is given by M over 2 times Q1 dot minus Q0 dot square from the exercise. So we see here again the two pictures. Let's draw the same kind of two pictures in P space and in Q dot space. Then uh, we have here our point which uh, uh, is possible and uh, its image under the Legendre transformation. Now if M is not invertible M is always a finite dimensional matrix or uh, because we have a finite number of variables. In a finite uh, dimensional case, if you have a matrix which is not invertible, the dimensionality of the image is reduced compared to the, the dimensionality of the full space. So the image cannot cover the entire space, but the image of the mapping can only cover a space with lower dimensions a lower dimensional subspace. So in this two-dimensional uh, picture it would be a one-dimensional line or a one-dimensional curve. The space and the image here of this mapping, it's a nonlinear mapping, the uh, set of points which uh, exist in the image, this is not a vector space or a similarly simple mathematical object, but it's a continuous maybe a smooth line and so the mathematical term is a manifold so what we get here is a manifold with lower dimensionality than the full space. So the image is a lower dimensional sub-manifold of the full space. So, and here it's just a curve. Okay, so if we would have a second point here, it would land automatically on the same curve. Now, um, but here in this case, um, we assume that our initial space is unrestricted. We still have uh, the full grid available and our equations of motion do not disallow um, any point here. So the space of the queues would still be completely full of possible points. That is uh, our assumption in this case one. And then we have the situation that a two-dimensional space of points is mapped to a one-dimensional manifold. What does that mean? <coughs> 
So let's first write down the original points or trajectories or, uh, or cover all of the Q dot space. That is our assumption. And then what do we get? Let's draw again the picture here, some points. All possible points lie on this line. And here in the original space, we have here, okay, let me not draw the grid, but let's think about something else. If we have this situation, then uh, we can ask which points are mapped onto that point here in P space. And there must be a multitude of points which are mapped to this one point because here we have two dimensions. That means there must be somehow a one dimensional line again, a curve, or also some manifold. And all of that yellow manifold is mapped onto this yellow point. So it must be like this. So for example, we have some point here, A, and a point A prime. And all of those A and A prime points, they are all mapped onto this single point here. On the other hand, we have of course here also some curve over there with a point B and another point B prime. And all of those infinitely many points on that yellow curve, they are mapped to this single point over here. So what that means is that we have equivalence classes. We have equivalence classes of points which are defined by uh, saying that all points in one equivalence class are mapped onto the same point in P space. So that this would be one equivalence class of points, that would be another equivalence class of points and so on. So that is an important notion. So the situation that we have here uh, defines equivalence classes in our configuration space variables. Then we can also look at trajectories. Let's look at trajectories. Where is another color? So here is some trajectory, for example. This is not a tra trajectory of the system, but an equivalence class, but a trajectory might look like that. So here we have our initial condition, and then this is a solution of the equation of motion, so this gives us the time dependence of our system. Now, this is a trajectory, and it passes here this equivalence class. Uh, but this point is completely equivalent to that point or to any other point on the line. And uh, so for every other point on the trajectory, there is an entire equivalence class of points with the same physical meaning. So for example, we could also look at the following trajectory, which starts out the same way. And then it somehow deviates and it goes on like that. So here is a trajectory prime. And uh, both blue trajectories are physically equivalent because they are mapped to the same trajectory here in p-space. And so you see that uh, the initial condition on both blue trajectories are of course the same. They start at the same phase space point and also they remain identical for a while and then at some point here they start deviating. And so that shows you that the initial conditions cannot be sufficient to completely fix your solutions of equation of motion. And so we do not only have equivalence classes of points, but we also have equivalence classes of trajectories. And we see that initial conditions cannot be um, sufficient to fix them. So we have a gauge invariance or a gauge redundancy um, in our system. So let's write that down.
Okay, so uh, to summarize all of this, all points on one equivalence class correspond to the same PI. So they also have the same dynamics and therefore the same physical meaning. Therefore there is not a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, the variables and physics, but there is a many-to-one mapping between the variables and the physics. So we have a redundant description. Redundancy in our description. We have more variables than we would strictly need in order to describe physics unambiguously. So infinitely many trajectories in this q and q dot space. correspond to the same physics. And that uh, corresponds to having gauge redundancy. In our variables or in our description and also gauge invariance And for example, we can do a gauge transformation of our solutions. Gives another solution. Okay. So something like this going from one blue trajectory to the other one would be a gauge transformation. And uh, you don't change the physical meaning of your sol uh, solution, but you change the variables of it. That is a gauge transformation. And so if you count the number of physical degrees of freedom in this case, you would of course say, that uh, the number of physical degrees of freedom is less than the number of variables here because there are redundant variables and so it's smaller than n, smaller than the number of variables. And uh, for you to keep in mind is this prototype example from the exercise that I already wrote down. And just to summarize some of its properties that we have seen in the exercise, the most general solution of the equation of motion would be qi of t is equal to vi times t plus ci plus an arbitrary function of time, which is however the same for both variables arbitrary function of time and uh, what is important is that this does not have an index i it must be the same function for both variables but otherwise it's arbitrary and this is uh, the gauge invariance that we have here you can gauge transform your solutions by such an arbitrary function of time and obtain other solutions and therefore clearly not uh, all aspects of the variables contain physical meaning and the phase space of this example is exactly like that only that on the right our cases are even simpler we always have straight lines as these equivalence classes as we saw and so there is now what we call a constraint in our system so 
um, the title of this section is called constraints and where are now the constraints? The constraint is that our P space is not um, filled with points but the points lie on some hypersurface in the space and this is the constraint. And so this constraint is now defined by an equation that we have obtained. Namely we can write the constraint by defining a function chi which is the sum P1 plus P0 in that example and then the constraint reads chi is equal to 0. Namely P1 plus P0 had to be 0. That was our constraint. So uh, that meant this uh, diagonal in this direction that was the only allowed region in the P space of this uh, example. And so we can write it as P1 plus P0 equal to 0. That is a constraint equation. Then we also saw that in this example the Hamiltonian was ambiguous. So it cannot be uh, just obtained by the Legendre transformation, um, but it, uh, it's obtained in a more complicated way. And uh, so, for example, uh, it also contained an arbitrary function of time. So there is an infinite set of different Hamiltonians which correspond to the same system. Okay, so that explains our first case with gauge invariance and then let us also explain the second case without gauge invariance. So again, let us assume that the matrix M is not invertible. And then we have a second case, case 2. And now the picture is quite obvious what to expect. Namely, we have here the P space and here the Q dot space. And as before, since a finite dimensional matrix is not invertible, its image cannot cover the whole space, but only a submanifold of lower dimension. That is the same as before. But now, uh, in this case, if we go back to the Q dot space, we also have a reduced dimensionality. So also here, we must lie on some uh, lower dimensional submanifold. And then any Q dot or uh, value outside of this curve doesn't exist, cannot appear as an initial condition or cannot appear as a solution of the equations of motion. So even in Q dot space, only uh, sub-manifold is possible. as initial conditions or as solutions to the equations of motion. Okay, That's the simple difference. And uh, there is not much more that one should say in general. Let me all also remind you of the prototypical example. Which was this, L equal m over 2 q1 dot square minus qb square over 2m2 m1 plus q1 dot qb. And the point of this example is that there is one variable qb 
whose q dot uh, doesn't appear at all. And if you take the equation of motion for qb, it's a purely algebraic equation and qb dot doesn't appear at all. So you can just completely write qb as a function of all the other canonical variables and so in this sense qb is an abbreviation. It's an auxiliary variable which does not have its own physics, it doesn't have its own dynamics. You cannot impose any initial condition on qb because anyway it's fixed by the other variables. And so, for example, to be concrete in this particular example, the equations of motion simply tell us QB is equal to M2 times Q1 dot. So once you know the dynamics of Q1, uh, QB is completely fixed. Its initial conditions are fixed and its time evolution is fixed as well. So you could say it's an abbreviation or sometimes called auxiliary variable. without independent dynamics. So, and then you can plug this in and uh, in this particular case you obtain then the equation of motion m1 plus m2 times q1 double dot is equal to zero. So we see that q1 is just a free particle and uh, therefore we have one degree of freedom instead of two. Now, uh, also to connect this to the language of constraints, so here again in the space of the piece it looks similar to the case before but in the Q dot space it looks different from the case before and so uh, we have a constraint here which defines this surface uh, which is an equation um, of uh, between the piece but there is an additional constraint which also acts here on this space but which reflects the fact that we already have this constraint here. And so let me write down the two constraints that we have in this particular system. So we have one function chi1 which is just uh, the momentum pb and we have a second function chi2 which is the following P1 minus M1 over M2 QB minus QB. So it's written in a very pedestrian way. You could simplify it also. But the constraints are then chi1 is equal to chi2 is equal to zero. These are the two constraints. And we encountered both constraints in the exercise. First of all, the Legendre transformation directly gives you Pb must be identically zero because Pb is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Qb dot which doesn't appear. So that was immediately zero. We found that uh, as the first thing and that is of course a constraint here which acts on this space. But then the equation of motion uh, also uh, give us some constraint namely that one. So this relationship between P1 and QB is a uh, consequence of the equation of motion like this one or that one you can combine them and obtain this relationship between the canonical variables P1 and QB. So that is a second constraint which also exists. Both constraints must be fulfilled. Uh, of course this is difficult to draw because we only draw the P space and not the Q space but it's a constraint which acts between all canonical variables. So here we have two constraints, in the other case we had one constraint. And now let me just give you the general definitions of the theory of constraints, but we will not do in this lecture um, the theory of constraints in its entirety. That would be another semester and we don't need this, but I want to give you the definitions so that you see the starting points and that will be sufficient for us. And I think now you have all the intuition that you need to also go on if you are interested in following up on this topic.
So, general definitions. So, in complete generality, a constraint in this language and in this setting is an equation, chi, which is a function of the p's and q's equal to zero, as we have discussed it just now. So any equation of the type which acts uh, or which must act on the phase space. The constraints must be time independent. And the time evolution is now given by Poisson brackets. So you can write the time dependence as a Poisson bracket of chi with what is called a total Hamiltonian HT. And uh, that is zero if all the constraints are satisfied. So here this HT is what is called total Hamiltonian. And this might be different from the normal uh, Legendre uh, definition of the Hamiltonian. So this total Hamiltonian must be defined in such a way that it really defines the correct time evolution of the phase space variables such that uh, its equations of motion are compatible with the Lagrangian equation of motion and that is not always the case if you have those constraints. Uh, it's not always the case for the standard definition if you have constraints and therefore you must modify the Hamiltonian in an appropriate way. The modification is then called total Hamiltonian. It generates the time evolution and then the constraints are defined in such a way that uh, if they are satisfied at one point in time, they are satisfied at all points in time. Otherwise it would be inconsistent. So and in general there are many constraints. I, I equals zero. And so they, of course, define a sub-manifold in phase space. And all initial conditions and all trajectories Um, remain on this submanifold. Good. And now we can classify according to the two cases that we had before. There is what one calls a first class constraint. A first class constraint has the following Poisson bracket. Poisson bracket of first class constraint with all possible constraints must be zero or is zero. That is the definition of a first class constraint. If its Poisson bracket with all other constraints vanishes, then it is called first class. And obviously, the opposite defines second class constraints. So, 
a second glass constraint has at least one non-vanishing Poisson bracket with some of the other constraints. So there exists another constraint for which the Poisson bracket doesn't vanish. And okay, out of all these constraints uh, you have many equations, so you have a system of equations. You can rearrange the equations in the usual way and obtain equivalent systems of equation. So you can optimize how you order the constraints and for example you can disentangle as much as possible your first class and your second class constraints. Right? I mean an equation this uh, system of equations is not unique. You could multiply chi 2 by a factor and so on and in this way obtain other but equivalent equations. So by performing uh, or by forming suitable linear combinations we can always disentangle Uh, the first class and second class constraints such that in the end we get the following simple picture namely all constraints chi k are decomposed into first class constraints and second class constraints chi l with the following the Poisson brackets of the second class constraints chi L and another second class constraint chi M. This Poisson bracket now gives us a matrix with indices LM, CLM and this matrix is invertible. This matrix is invertible. If you have reduced it to such a matrix which is invertible then you cannot reduce it any further. So you, if, because you could always add a first class constraint to a second class constraint and then it remains second class, right? If you add first class plus second class it becomes second class. But you can split off as much as possible all the first class constraints from your second class constraints and once you have reached this where the determinant here is non-zero then you cannot uh, split off any further first class constraints with vanishing Poisson brackets. That is the point. So with determinant of that matrix C is non-zero. Then you have completely disentangled your constraints into some which are definitely only second class and uh, others which are completely first class and uh, somehow no mixtures. And then, of course, how the equations look like is your choice. You can optimize the equations however you like them, multiply with factors, do some other linear combinations and so on. But the dimensionality of the matrix C is uniquely fixed. And you cannot change it by forming uh, ingenious other linear combinations. So there is a fixed number which comes from the structure of your system, a fixed number of second class constraints. You cannot reduce them or uh, increase them. The, uh, in this sense uh, there is a fixed number of second class constraints. Now what do we know about this number of second class constraints? It is um, uh, the number of second class constraints is the dimensionality of that matrix C. And what do we know about the matrix C? The matrix C is anti-symmetric because the Poisson bracket is anti-symmetric. And so we have an anti-symmetric invertible matrix. 
Do you know anything about an anti-symmetric invertible matrix? Uh, what could be its dimension? How many entries? One by one? One by one is also a matrix, right? Could it be a one by one matrix with one second class constraint? The dimension must be even. So there can be no system with one second class constraint uh, because a sec one second class constraint would give a contradiction because of the anti-symmetric Poisson bracket. So there must be an even number of second class constraints and the dimensionality of that matrix is uh, even. So since C is anti-symmetric and invertible, there is an even number of second class constraints. And uh, there is uh, at most a possible exception for fermionic systems. Where the Poisson bracket doesn't have to be anti-symmetric because there comes in a, an additional minus from the fermion uh, anti-commutation relations. But for bosonic systems, what we say here is correct. And so now, uh, let's just finish this section by some interpretations. So second class constraints, what are they? Second class constraints uh, have an even number, so in the simplest case there are two. And uh, that was the case of our example. In our example we had two constraints and essentially one was for P, B and one was for Q, B. So, uh, in, and that is basically the prototype of the general case. You have an even number of constraints and they come in pairs and for each constraint essentially fixes one pair of Q and P there is one constraint for Q and one constraint for P. And that is also why the Poisson bracket between the two is not zero. So they are constraints on pairs like P, B and Q, B. And uh, they are simply fixed by the constraints. That is the typical thing. So we have one pair of canonical variables which are entirely fixed by the constraints and therefore they do not have their own dynamics. They are just auxiliary variables. And very often these uh, variables can just be eliminated from the Lagrangian and then also from the Hamiltonian. For example, by just plugging in the equations of motion or the solution of the equations of motion is plugged into the Lagrangian, then you obtain a simpler Lagrangian which is sufficient to describe the system completely. So and these variables may simply be viewed as abbreviations. or some expression of the other variables, so, so typically for their solutions of the respective equations of motion. Good, so that is second class constraints. They correspond to auxiliary variables which can be eliminated. First class constraints correspond to gauge invariants. So they are those um, constraints which have vanishing Poisson brackets. And in the case of our first example, there was only one constraint. Of course, it has vanishing Poisson brackets with, it, with itself. And therefore, it was first class and it corresponds to gauge invariants. So this is like the constraint on 
P0 in our first example, while in that example Q0 was completely free. So that corresponds to gauge invariance. Okay, and uh, now let me only give you some indications for how you can go on. So one note, in general, the transition from Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian in case of constraints is quite non-trivial. The same is true for setting up Poisson brackets. And in particular, in the quantum theory, Poisson brackets should be converted into commutators. Therefore, also setting up the correct quantum theory commutators is non-trivial. So, the standard Legendre definition of the Hamiltonian is often not sufficient. And uh, Poisson brackets cannot be used for commutators. For example, if you have the constraint P is zero, like we had, then you cannot impose a commutator. P commutator with Q is I times H bar, while P is zero at the same time. So that becomes inconsistent, and therefore you have something non-trivial going on there. Similarly, uh, this transition is sometimes non-trivial. And uh, let me give you the literature where you can find the general case. The completely general case is discussed in a very nice and very complicated book by Eno Teitelboim. That we have here in our library. And there, what we discussed here is uh, a part of their chapter one, and uh, then they have 15 or so more chapters on this sort of formalism. And they tell you exactly the completely general case, how to define, for example, this total Hamiltonian, which gives you the correct equations of motion in the Hamiltonian picture, which correspond to the original Lagrangian. You find the summary of this in Weinberg's quantum field theory book in uh, section 7.6. And also there is a very nice but not so well-known quantum field theory book by Duncan. Uh, his book is extremely similar in uh, the approach to Weinberg's book, but the explanations are often written in a different way, and so the two books complement each other very nicely. So he has also essentially the same content on uh, this topic here. And uh, so what I want to tell you now is that we do not need the completely general formalism in this lecture. Um, what do we need? What we need is basically what we have seen in our examples in the exercise that will be uh, practically sufficient for us. And you find the general case of such systems also in the Weinberg book. Uh, seven appendix, so he has an appendix to his section 7, and in that appendix he discusses a few special cases, and those are exactly the special cases that we will need here, and they correspond also to our exercise. And there is a paper which I wanted to give you, it's a uh, HEP TH03010 and that is a paper on the situation um, on of the quantization of a Schrödinger field. Uh, 
That is uh, a case which is kind of important, not very important, but a little bit important for us. At least we will touch upon it. And uh, that is not covered by this uh, appendix of Weinberg, but you see here in that paper uh, the completely general treatment of that example as well. Okay. This, for me, would end our discussion of the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formalism. And so now we have repeated uh, everything that we needed to repeat. And so we can go on with other topics next week. And for the rest of the lesson today, we can now come to the exercise. Unless you